So one of the things that's come up a lot in the course of my career is helping people develop better sleep habits. And that's been across the board from people I've worked with who are professional athletes who had very sporadic travel schedules to um, people who had been in uh, overseas in war to people who just have like crazy lifestyles and stressful careers. Uh, that's something that can affect a lot of people. Some people it becomes a chronic problem. Some people it's just it might be like an intermittent thing, like you might generally sleep really good and then you might have a period where you might know why, you might not know why, but for some reason you're having trouble going to sleep. So I think in general this can be split into two categories. we got people who have trouble going to sleep and then we have people who have trouble staying asleep. Those can be a little bit different, but a lot of the same strategies will help both. So, um... So just looking at some basic things, and none of this stuff is super complicated, but um, if, if you're having trouble going to sleep or staying asleep, it's I've, I've had a lot of luck with a lot of these things. Now, if you have something serious like a medical condition, uh, we're not going to be touching on any of that today. So if you need to go see some kind of a specialist, go do that. However, I will say that a lot of the things I'm going to talk about do file under... Um, we consider kind of basic sleep hygiene. And it can be good to sort of check these things off before you start exploring. Um, I would say kind of check these things off and make sure they're taken care of before you start exploring things that might be more involved. So um, one thing to keep in mind, and, and I guess we, we, can, we can kind of have a third category as well, and that's people who just do not get enough sleep. Okay, that was me for a long time. I chronically underslept for years and it was sort of a work and career related thing. Um, you know, I guess if I could, like, if I could choose to, I wouldn't sleep. I would just I would stay up, I would work, I would read, I would do anything. I just, I've never really enjoyed sleep. I don't look forward to it, but that's not important. But some people accidentally kind of shortchange themselves because they either stay up too late or they get up too early or vice versa. So one thing we have to look at when we're looking at sleep is you need to understand that the quality of your sleep starts before you go to bed. Okay, it's it, how you set things up for your evening's rest <clears throat> is very important. So like if you're just going, 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 going and then trying to go to bed, that's not going to work for many people unless you go to bed absolutely exhausted and that's probably not healthy either. So if you're having trouble either going to sleep or staying asleep, what you need to do is you, you gotta adapt better sleep hygiene and this is gonna start about 30 to 60 minutes before you go to sleep, okay? So I'm just gonna go through some quick things that are mostly pretty easy to apply. Um, some of them are a little more involved, but <clears throat> so Let's see here, we're going to say, again, so 30 to 60 minutes before you go to bed, um, you need to stop doing anything that is mentally stimulating. So I think most people know by now that like looking at smartphones, looking at computer screens, even televisions, um, this provides a type of stimulation that makes it harder to, re harder to relax. Um, basically, if you're looking at that type of light, without some kind of filter, uh, you're giving your brain the signal that it's supposed to be alert. So, for um, I don't think that's a problem for everybody, but I know for some people it definitely is. So, if you're having trouble going to sleep, one of the things you probably need to do is about 30 to 60 minutes before bed, you need to put away the cell phone. You might even consider putting it on airplane mode and just like putting it in a box or something. Um, and then, you know, not working right up to the last minute. And if you're going to watch something in the evening, uh, you might consider watching something that isn't exciting. Okay, so uh, if I watch something before I go to bed, it tends to be something that's funny. Uh, Psych, which is an older show now, but it's, uh, it's a great show. And Monk, those are two of my uh, staples, I guess, because they're, for the most part, they're funny, and it puts me in a good mood before I go to bed, and that's better. Then looking at something that's um, really intense or really getting me like you know kind of wound up uh, so for some of you 
So good habits to do before you go to sleep are going to be stretching. Uh, for some people that might mean yoga, but if yoga is your go-to, that's fine. Just make sure it's not a, a yoga that's intended to be very challenging, okay? It needs to be more of a relaxing kind of stretch yoga. Um, and then reading can be a good option for some people. So just, again, make sure you're reading something that isn't real stimulating. Um, that doesn't mean it needs to be boring, but just it doesn't need to be something that's real thought-provoking, most likely, you know, leading up to sleep. Um, okay, another thing you can do, so uh, something that I've done with a lot of clients over the years that I've had a lot of luck with is utilizing magnesium and a combination of magnesium and taurine before bed. So magnesium is a mineral that is responsible, responsible for between 600 and 1,000 different functions of the body. Um, you will hear a lot of people say it's responsible for like 300 functions of the body. That is, that's an old estimate from like the 80s or the 90s, so, but you'll still hear that. Uh, I think current estimates are somewhere between 600 and 1,000, so it does a lot of different things, and I have no idea what like 550 of those things are, okay? Um, uh, it's, uh, it, magnesium is responsible for a lot of different things in the body a lot. One thing that's important to understand when you think about magnesium, because some people will say that magnesium is for sleep, and that's, that's not even remotely close. Um, magnesium is a little bit of an, it's, it's not a true adaptogen because it's a mineral, but it's, it acts like an adaptogen as much as a mineral can. What that means is, if you take magnesium during the daytime, um, provided that you're not super stressed or chronically sleep deprived, if you take it during the daytime, what's going to happen is magnesium on a cellular level will actually help your cells to produce energy, okay? Works with the mitochondria to literally make energy in your cells. So if we take magnesium during the daytime, it should actually help us have energy. Now, it's not going to be like a, it doesn't act like a stimulant, so it's, it's much more subtle than that, but I, like I take magnesium during the day and I take magnesium in the evening because it does a lot of different things, so I don't just take it at night. Oh. I have used magnesium post-workout to help come down from a workout, and that can be very beneficial. It depends on how intense the workout is and all that. So, um, I even one time, because magnesium can have a calming effect, so it, I didn't explain this, I apologize. An adaptogen basically... Um, what that means is, when I take a substance that's an adaptogen, if I need more of something, it will regulate up, but if you need less, it'll regulate down. So that means that if you take magnesium during the day, it should help your cells to produce energy, but if you take it after a workout, after a game, um, or even one time I took it uh, before I went to a meeting where I knew going into the meeting that I was going to be irritated because I didn't agree with the person who was going to be speaking, basically, to keep it sort of polite. Uh, so I took about 400 milligrams of magnesium before the meeting, and I still didn't like the meeting, but when I left, I knew I was in a, I was in a calmer mood than I would have been without it. So um, there's that. So if you know you're going to get into an argument with somebody and you don't want to lose it, you might try taking some magnesium and taurine uh, beforehand. It'll just, it'll help a little bit. And taurine is an amino acid. Weirdly, it's in Red Bull. I don't know if that just kind of helps people not get too stimulated from things like that, but you see it in a lot of energy drinks. Uh, but taurine does help to calm you down. So uh, Now, as far as how much taurine, that's going to depend on the person. Some people need more than less. I usually start people with a gram, and then if they need a little bit more, then we'll go to two grams. Um, uh, magnesium, the recommended dose... Not the RDA, but from like health professionals, is uh, 10 milligrams per kilo of body weight. So, um, for a lot of people, somewhere between like 400 to 600 milligrams a day is is much better than taking nothing. So, um, but uh, taking magnesium and taurine either like after a workout, after a game, or before you go to bed could do a lot to just help you calm down. It'll make it easier to sleep. And I've had a lot of clients who um, even just did magnesium and got great results from it. So, um, let me see here. And some people, so depending on like 
when I've had people who were really having a bit difficult time with the sleep and it was they really needed to get under control, what I recommend is doing some magnesium and taurine uh, about halfway through dinner, and then doing it again about 30 minutes before bed. So if it's if you just want to try it, just start. I would start before bed and see how it how, see how it goes. And if you feel like it's not quite enough, then I would I would do a dose at dinner, do a dose before bed. And, uh, go from there. So another thing that can uh, factor in for some people is the temperature. So if, um, and this is one of those areas where like I know people are different but most people will sleep best when the temperature is about 68 degrees. So just you can play with that if you want. I know that can be difficult for uh, people in relationships when you get one person wants it warmer, one person wants it colder. That's that's your business, not mine. I just know that most people, 68 degrees, they sleep best. So, um, another thing that can be real useful is blackout shades. So, um, like the house that I live in, it has windows everywhere, and there is so much ambient light that pretty much at night, if I just close my shades, I I, I can all. I could probably almost read, okay, there's so much ambient light. So I put blackout curtains in the back of my house where I sleep a few years ago and that's helped a lot. Um, the reason for that is when light touches your skin, you won't make melatonin. Um, for those of you that have kids, so if you're watching this because you have a little kid and the kid's not sleeping good, if they have a nightlight, good luck. I don't know what to tell you other than like I would say like try and weed them off the light because if light touches their skin, um, they're not going to make melatonin as well and they're going to have a harder time sleeping. Uh, along those lines, it, it can help to understand that teenagers tend to produce melatonin later in the evening so they can have a sort of naturally have a hard time going to bed early um, just because their body's not ready for it. So like that's just a phase some people go through, they'll get out of it and they'll, it, the melatonin production will change, but uh, that is a thing for teenagers. So let's see, and also for kids, uh, something I've had some clients do that's worked pretty well when we talk about like the magnesium and the taurine um, is uh, you can get some topical magnesiums and if you put them like behind the knees or on the bottom of the feet uh, before they go to bed, that, that can be an alternative to trying to get a kid to take a, take a pill. So. And with little kids, I would just start with the magnesium and try that. But that's that's something you can try if um, if taking pills is a, a good option. Okay, so those are some of the strategies you can apply as far as the like getting to sleep better. Um, so magnesium and taurine. Think about the temperature of the room. That room needs to be as dark as possible. Okay. Again, if light touches your skin, um, it's gonna it's gonna impact how good you sleep. Um, and then some kind of stretching or something before you go to bed to get your body to relax. I used to do, um, I don't even know why I stopped, but uh, for a while I would do calligraphy before I went to bed because that was relaxing for me. So, um, the other side of this, okay, so we have the going to bed side. The other side of this is the actual waking up. And this is important because sometimes the problem is how people get up. That's kind of where it starts, okay? So, like, if again, if someone's not sleeping enough, like they're getting up, they have to get up early so they don't go to bed, or they don't go to bed early enough. That's just something you have to address. So most people need between seven and nine hours of sleep. Um, I have known a couple people, and I, I mean like two, who did good on six hours, but for most people that's not great. Um, I've known a few people that tried to get by on like four hours of sleep and that's really uh, not safe, honestly. So um, I know I've read about a couple studies that have shown that people who are like sleep deprived, their driving patterns are similar to people that are drunk. So just like, uh, don't take sleep for granted. I probably should open with that actually. That's something that uh, I've just seen a lot, even for people that are just trying to get leaner uh, or they're trying to build muscle. Like if you're trying to if you're trying to improve your body composition and you don't get enough sleep, uh, you, you you should just start another hobby until you get that 
squared away because you're not going to see good results. Um, so as far as getting up in the morning, this could be important because it just affects the whole thing. Uh, so one thing that I've used for probably 10 years now is what's called a, a sunlight clock. Um, not a sundial, but a sunlight clock. So what this light does is instead of blaring an alarm to wake me up in the morning, um, I set it about I set it for about 30 minutes before I'm going to go to sleep, and it has it has a scale uh, as far as like how what it does is it turns on a light and it's supposed to simulate because again like sunlight will wake us up we're not supposed to sleep with this light shining on us. Um, so, so what this light does is, um, you have to kind of, you have to find the setting where it's an adequate enough light to wake you up. For some people that'll be less, for some people it'll be, it'll be brighter. I pretty much, I've always had to put mine on the maximum. But about 30 minutes before I want to wake up, it'll, it'll turn on and it'll start with a very dim light and it'll gradually get up to whatever I've set it for. Um, and then I have the option of making it make like a, uh, it has some kind of nature sound that I can do if I want, but I don't always need that. So I found that if I get enough sleep, the light is enough to wake me up. Um, if I uh, if I haven't been sleeping good, then you know the alarm's necessary. But for the most part, I sleep pretty good. I've had good sleep for a long time now. So. Uh, that can be a good option just because it's a better way to wake up. It's not as um, stressful as having like an alarm blaring. It's a little more subtle. Um, and again, I've had the same light for like 10 years now and I haven't. Uh, hopefully, I'm not screwing myself, but I haven't um, had to change the light bulb or anything. So I have no idea what kind of light bulb's in it. I just know that I plug it in and it's worked for 10 years. Um, something else that, uh, it's worth mentioning is if you wake up in the morning and you go back to sleep, you're rebooting the sleep cycle and that can make it really difficult to get up and it can make it to where when, once you wake up, you feel more tired than you did before. So, I know like occasionally I'll wake up a little bit earlier than I want to, um, we all know that sucks, <laughs> but I have found that if I just go ahead and get up, even though like I, I probably won't be real happy for the first little bit, I will feel much more alert than if I let myself go back to sleep. Um, and if I let myself go back to sleep, I might sleep for two or three hours. Um, so it's, because uh, if I go back to sleep, I'll go into like a really deep, deep, I'm out. <clears throat> so... If you wake up a little bit early, if you wake up an hour, you'll have to just assess that, but it's something to keep in mind. So if you find that you wake up and you go back to sleep and you have a really hard time getting up, you might be better off just getting up when you wake up the first time and try to go to bed a little bit earlier than that night and just sort of get a better handle on it. Uh, one final thing that I'll throw out there is, um, so one of the hormones that affects your sleep is cortisol, okay? And... I know a lot of people have heard of cortisol, a lot of people don't understand it. Uh, I, I remember a couple of years ago I mentioned it to somebody I was working with and they, their response was, it's one of those bad hormones. It's, it's not a bad hormone. Cortisol is important. You need it. Uh, the thing about cortisol is we have what's called a cortisol curve. Okay, So cortisol is supposed to be elevated in the morning and it's supposed to sort of gradually go down as the day goes on. It's not supposed to be elevated all the time, which that's... Maybe I'll do a video on cortisol, but um, the point is, in the morning, it's supposed to be elevated. So what happens to some people is they end up with a reverse cortisol curve, where at night, they're real stimulated and they're real alert. In the morning, they're super groggy and they have a hard time getting up. Uh, taking acetyl-L-carnitine first thing in the morning can help to elevate cortisol levels. And I've had very good results with that over the years, both with myself and with clients who had trouble sort of waking up. So... Um, that's something you can look into. Um, honestly, at the top of my head, I'm not sure about the dose. I haven't had to use that in a long time, but it's uh, it can be beneficial. So if you if you find that like at night you're very alert and in the morning you're real groggy, 
it, it could be something that helps. So, um, and you can either, I've had some clients where the way I approached it was on the sleep end with magnesium and everything. And I've had a couple people over the years where we just tried some acetyl carnitine in the morning to help them wake up better and sort of, I'm not, I'm not claiming that it's going to reset the cortisol curve, but it's, uh, it can help move things in a good direction. So, okay. Uh, we could talk about sleep for a long time, but uh, I think I'm out of words for the day. So if you have any questions, feel free to post them. Um, again, if you have something like sleep apnea or something more, you know, like medical, you might, you know, go to a specialist and get that figured out. I've, I've known several people who had sleep apnea who just, they got it fixed and after that they were fine. Um, so yeah, that's it. Uh, be healthy, be productive, get some sleep. Thanks.